Welcome back to Tom's World Scale Model Series. In this episode, we unbox Meng's 135th scale Willys MB Jeep. If you enjoy programming on scale modeling, then show your support by subscribing to this channel. Leave us a comment, like, dislike, or share the video with friends. Clicking the notification bell gives you alerts when we post new content. Or visit the channel Tom's World for a friendly visit for a complete list of all our videos. With the storm clouds of World War II gathering, American military planners worked feverishly to provide their ground forces with much needed mobility. One such requirement was for an off-road capable, light-duty, all-purpose, highly mobile truck. After a lengthy design process, the Venerable Willys MB or Jeep was born. The result, a lightweight and sturdy vehicle that was capable of hauling heavy loads over the roughest of terrain. Perhaps no other vehicle epitomized America's wartime ingenuity and crushing manufacturing might. A staggering 640,000 Jeeps were built between 1941 to 45. So stout and iconic was the design that the Jeep brand lives on as a popular consumer vehicle even to this day. Stay with us as we explore Meng's brand new homage to this legendary all-terrain workhorse. So greetings and welcome back and as always thank you so much for joining me again today. Well we've got uh, Meng's brand new release here of the what they're calling the MB Military Vehicle and uh, this is in 135th scale kit VS011. It was released earlier in North America this year 2020 probably about March or April. It goes for 28 US or 38 Canadian dollars today so kind of a mid-price kit. And we'll put up the box dimensions real quick just so you know exactly what you get if you do decide to buy this kit. So beautiful box art depicts a vehicle from the 1st Army Division, Normandy, 1944, probably just past the uh, D-Day invasion around there. You can see some uh, P-51s, uh, well, Mustangs in the background there, three of them, probably on an interdiction mission or a ground attack mission, some smoke going there in the background. Some bad's happening in there. We don't see what, what's burning, but well, there that is. And it's painted kind of in its realism style. It's just beautiful. And it's got that pastel faded look, just like the FT-17 uh, packaging. And it always gives it kind of a vintage feel for me, because it kind of looks like a faded photograph. But it looks fantastic. Really liking that. And just to note these, uh, this stencil here on this ammo box. So they'll have some significance as we discuss the decals in the kit. So just keep that in mind. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about why we don't see the word Jeep on any of this packaging. Uh, you know, people that have been in the hobby or, uh, you know, guys that like uh, military vehicles you know the whole story behind the Jeep thing, but there might be new people, so we'll talk about that real briefly. And I will also touch on the legendary 7 versus 9 grill controversy. Yeah, well, we walk out here and, uh, but, you know, it's kind of interesting to learn a little bit about the legacy and the backstory of the vehicles that we're building. So before we do that, a quick tour of the box. So uh, just on this side, your standard uh, kind of model kit, uh, you know, uh, printing there, just so we know what it is when it sits on a shelf. It's exactly the same thing on the opposite side. And then uh, over here, we've got, uh, just like the FT-17 packaging, uh, we've got the AK colors here. So uh, if we do want to use AK, it gives us a good chart here. That's repeated in the instructions, so we won't uh, get into it too much now and your basic uh, QR code. So if you do have the proper app on your phone, you can just uh, sort of flash it on these codes and it'll take you to their websites. And uh, then on this side of the box, finally, just a little write-up on the kit. And actually, the English translation is not too bad here. And it does give us the, uh, the little vehicle dimensions here. So the finished model is going to be 95.6 millimeter times 55.2 millimeters. And uh, for our American friends, 3.76 inches times 2.17 inches, so a tiny little model. And uh, here we've just got, uh, well, a nice colored depiction of the vehicle, again, from that uh, First Infantry Division. But we'll get that more. That's explained a little bit more in the instructions. Well, so there's the box. So why do we not see the word Jeep on a lot of this packaging? You'll notice in our product line section that most of the manufacturers that produce a kit of this vehicle avoid the word Jeep, not only in their packaging, but also in their instructions. So why is that? Well, actually, the word Jeep is a trademark. It was trademarked by Fiat Chrysler Automobile. So in other words, a uh, trademark is just a piece of intellectual property that's protected by law. So for example, if you wanted to make a t-shirt with the word Jeep on it and sell it, if it's a commercial venture, you have to get uh, permission from the trademark owner as well as likely pay royalties. And that might be a reason why a lot of the manufacturers just avoid that uh, whole thing altogether. That might be part of the reason. Another reason might be is that the vehicle actually has uh, quite a few official and non-official names. Willys MB, Ford GPW, U.S. Army Truck, 4x4, Quarter Ton, and Quarter Ton Recon Truck. 
uh, are all correct names for this vehicle. So the manufacturers have a lot of latitude. So why mess with trademarks when you can just call it something else and uh, totally be accurate? So there that is. That's the reason why we don't see that word Jeep on a lot of the packaging. So just to touch uh, on real quick the whole grill controversy. So there were two uh, manufacturers involved in this prototype when it was being developed in 1940-41. And that was Willie's Overland and Ford. And Ford's version had this uh, single piece stamped grill with nine slots in it. And I don't know whether they patented it, trademarked it or what, but uh, Willie's Overland decided not to copy that and they went with a seven uh, sort of a slotted version. And that's how the uh, two vehicles are differentiated. And eventually when it went into the, uh, you know, the production run, they did go with the Ford version just because it was uh, very inexpensive to produce. It was very strong. It was cheaper to produce. So that's kind of the iconic nine slotted version that we see. Now Overland, um, Willie's Overland, you know, it changed hands over, over the years. And uh, today if we look at the actual Jeep consumer model uh, by the Chrysler Group, uh, if we look at the grill, it's got seven slots in it. And they've kept that, I don't know whether that's a heritage thing or a respect thing. And there's various theories about that if we really want to wonk out about it, about seven continents where the Jeep served and all the rest of it. I'm not going to get into that. But uh, you got to make sure that your kit's got nine slots because that's the correct one. Now, what's interesting is that um, the Humvee, which was uh, developed for the military by AM General, it actually also had a grill that had seven slots. And I guess that they got away with it because it was a military vehicle. Now, when AM General decided to go with a commercial model, if you look at it, it does have the seven, uh, the seven slots. Now, that might not be a big deal, but actually there were court cases over that. And I guess Chrysler might have sued AM uh, General for that. And in fact, some of the news stories say that they lost. Now, it's no longer an issue because the Humvee and Hummer aren't produced anymore uh, for the commercial market. But, uh, you know, if you kind of want to wonk out on that whole seven versus nine uh, grill slot uh, issue, then, uh, well, there it is. So, but just make sure your kid has nine slots because that's the correct one. So there it is. All right, so now uh, we like to go into our little product line section. Now, because Meng's only got the two releases, that's not going to totally work for us. But uh, we'll look at some other manufacturers, so if you do decide to build the Jeep kit, we can see that we have a lot of options. Meng is a relative newcomer to the Jeep vehicle line, their first release appearing as recently as 2019. The first offering, the Wasp Flamethrower Jeep, is a very interesting variant which helped the product stand out in an already crowded field. This kit shares many of the same components as the kit we'll be reviewing, so if you like our reviewed kit, then chances are you'll also like this one. Neither kit comes with figures, so those will have to be bought aftermarket or rated from our stash. Several manufacturers have released Jeep kits over the years, there's just too many to name them all, but let's look at some of the most notable ones. What look at the Jeep product line would be complete without mentioning these vintage monogram kits. The oldest dates back to 1957. And likely some of you may remember building this version when you were kids. We can still find this one for sale on eBay if nostalgia or collecting is your thing and prices vary anywhere between 24 to 90 US dollars. Italeri has offered no fewer than 11 releases of the Willys, although some have only been reboxings of prior releases. The ambulance and commando car versions are interesting variations on the theme. If you're into sacrificing a little bit of quality and detail for a lower price, then these kits are definitely worth searching out. They're older moldings, but at a bargain basement price, some go for as little as $15 US. These are ideal beginner kits. To me, a Meng and Tacom all reside in the mid-price product range. To me, I introduced three kits throughout the 70s, but these have largely disappeared from the mainstream. Their 1997 retooled release, Kit 35219, is perhaps their best known and most popular version of the Jeep. It's a very simple kit and carries all the quality synonymous with the Tamiya brand. Expect to pay around 24 United States dollars today for this kit. Tacom is a relative newcomer to the Jeep line and they've waited in with two releases. The first in 2019, Kit 2126, and that was followed by Kit 2131 in 2020. Both kits offer slight variations on the theme. One comes with a cargo trailer and the other is dolled up as the armored version. These kits retail for about 26 US today. Given that these kits include a full engine, photo etch and expanded part counts, with a price of only $2 more than the Tamiya kit, the Edge may go to Tacom for overall value. And finally in the deluxe category we find Dragon and Bronco. Bronco began releasing Jeep kits in 2012 and followed up with four additional offerings since. 
These tend to have value-added features, for example kit CB35107, that comes with a 37mm anti-tank gun, as well as the canvas roof molded in styrene. Kit CB35163 includes a 75mm pack howitzer and a trailer. Figures are also feature heavily in these kits, which will delight those figure painters out there. Expect to pay anywhere from 48 to 55 US for the Bronco kits. Dragon has released an astonishing 10 versions of the Jeep over a relatively short 8 year period starting in 2012. If one is looking for different variants of the Jeep, this line offers rich pickings. These kits contain high part counts, photo etch, clear parts and many value added features such as stowage, figures and other accoutrements. Like the Bronco kits, the Dragon line is for advanced modelers with a price to match 35 to 45 US or more. But for price, quality and value, we've had good experience with the Meng brand and given that this is a spanking new release, we settle on this kit for our unboxing and build. Alright, so let's dig into this thing. This is the best part, the unboxing. Oh, it's like a kid at Christmas time. I always get so excited. Oh, well, there it is. So many models, so little time. So Now, it won't be packaged exactly the same way because you know that I like to rummage through these things uh, before the video. Uh, four sprues in all. And we'll, let's see here, three solid ones and one clear one. I'm just going to pull everything out of the box and we'll lay it all out nicely just so we can uh, see what we get. And there it is there. Not a big kit, uh, 126 parts, I mean compared to the 330 parts in our Dragon SAS command vehicle version. Uh, there's the instructions and we always want to check the box to make sure there's no loose parts and we're good there. You don't want to throw away a part by accident. That could really spoil the day. So let me just lay it all out here. Uh, just so we get an idea of what we get. So a nice amount of parts, not a big kit, like I said, just in physical size and amount of parts. And uh, I'm just going to take everything out of the plastic and we'll have a quick look at the, uh, the instructions. But there it is, that's what you get in the box. Our instructions come in this booklet form. The booklet is rather small, but the illustrations are large. We have a repeat of the box art, obviously. And there's the Ming link in case you want to go visit and have a look at uh, what else Ming produces. Blank page, a little write up on the. Uh, on the vehicle's history in different languages and our obligatory uh, well tool list and safety precautions. So if you're a first time builder, have a look through that. And uh, just like the FT-17, right away we have to decide which variant we're gonna build, although I don't think they really vary much. But there it is there. I think we're gonna go with the Cal-50, the Ma Deuce. And I rather like the little bar up front here. We'll talk about that in a second, but I think I might combine this version with that bar, but we'll see. So uh, yeah, the instructions are almost Airfix-esque, but uh, very clear and we can see each step doesn't have too many parts in it, which is nice, which makes it clear and they're large uh, illustrations. And, and obviously the kit does come with an engine. The engine uh, molding is exquisite. Uh, it doesn't have a distribution cap nor the wires, so if you want to super detail your engine, you're going to have to add those. Uh, you'll see that the air filter is missing, but it's added later, so it is in the kit. So there's the engine going together. Very simple, our exhaust manifold, engine mating to the frame here. We do see we need to do a little bit of filling here and there. Kit suggests uh, CA glue, which is fine. We can, well, we've got our Mr. Surfacer and other, other fillers on the bench here we could use. Uh, there's a differential going through with some leaf springs, and we can see that the uh, shock absorbers are actually attached. So that's kind of interesting. Most manufacturers make those separate, but that's okay. That'll work for us. Now, what I really like about this kit, this is a great bonus, is uh, if you look carefully, the front wheels are steerable. Now, they're not synchronized. Yeah, there's the uh, little stabilization, uh, stabilizer bar, but uh, I do believe the wheels would, under this configuration, sort of uh, turn uh, differently. So you'd have to line them carefully. So uh, I like to pose my wheels turn, so this is fantastic. We don't have to fiddle with that and uh, do a little surgery like we had to do in our Kubel wagon, which is fine, but uh, again, they give it to us there. And uh, here are the two differentials. Now, it is a 4x4 vehicle, so that's why uh, it does have the two differentials. If you ever wondered how those two numbers work, if it's a 4x4, that means the vehicle has four wheels and a four-wheel drive. Uh, for example, if you have 4x2, that's your standard car, four wheels, two-wheel drive. And some of the, uh, you know, the um, German vehicles, 8x8s and 6x6s. And, well, in fact, the deuce and a half that we did in a, in a past kit review was a 6x6. But so this one's a 4x4. So there it is, a little shield with the, uh, well, the exhaust muffler. We'll have to see if we have to drill that out. There's our uh, steering column going in. We do have to drill some holes here, so make sure you have your pin vise handy when you're building this kit. Oh, there's a firewall. There's the horn. Tailgate looks like it needs to be filled. I'm not sure if that's because, uh, well, Ming also released that flamethrower version. I'm not sure if that's kind of a, a, a leftover from that. But we have to do a little bit of filling there, so be aware of that. 
Here's our gas tank. It looks like a first thing. We're not going to play guess the parts, but. So there's those steps there. We'd have to paint a little bit of silver here where we attach our uh, clear headlights. There's our radiator going in. Uh, body being attached to the frame. And uh, while well, we run into the first part of the kit that I don't like, and that's these two-part wheels. We'll look at those in the parts, but uh, I much more prefer the way Tamiya casts it. And indeed, the new Tacom kit, they do it like Tamiya does. It hides the seam. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Not the end of the world, but a little bit more work. And, uh, you know, maybe some people might even want to replace that with resin. So, well, we'll look at that in a moment. Okay, so just going on here. Now, we do notice that we do get decals, which we'll see in a second. And we get placards, which is fantastic. And our instrumentation decals. And, uh, you know, I gripe about that sometimes in the Tamiya kits. They don't have those. But uh, this comes with that, so that's fantastic. A couple more parts here to remove. We can see uh, the battery. And uh, here we can post the hood open or closed. I mean, I think if you're going to do that engine, build that engine and super detail it, uh, for sure that hood's got to come up. Uh, kind of blocking the modus, but it uh, should be okay. And uh, we're going to look at this windshield too. It's a little bit of an issue there. Not, not a big deal, but uh, and we get this little, uh, we get a few accessories actually in here. We get a little, uh, let's see here, first aid box, and we actually get a decal for it. So that's very cool. Nice little touch there. Uh, next few steps are just our seats. Very straightforward. Yeah, two going in there. And then here's some of the guardrails, some of the tools. I'm interested to see how delicate that part is, whether that should be PE. That's just the guard for the light. We'll have a look at that in a second. And the steering wheel going in. We did get some rug sacks, which is kind of nice to hang on the sides. Fire extinguisher. Our mirror. We don't get a little mylar mirror, unfortunately. So a little bit of dab, a dab of silver paint will do us there. And uh, we do so we get some jerry cans. And we do get some ammo crates. And as I, as I mentioned um, when we looked at the box art, we don't have decals for the ammo, ammo boxes. So those should be purchased separately. I'm sure Archer makes a kit for that. Here we're getting... Uh, our uh, Mod Deuce, our 50 cal together. And again, we don't get the, uh, the stencil decal there. So I think I might even have a stencil decal from Archer sitting around. But if not, I'm sure they have one available. And there's the Browning 30, if that's the one we decide to build. So there it is there. Interesting to see how the 50 needs the reinforcement post where the 30 doesn't. So Because that 50 is just a, a bear. I've seen demonstrations of this thing, and it can chew apart a cinder block wall. It's just an incredibly uh, powerful weapon. Hard to believe they mounted it on this little Jeep. Now, mind you, I think they even went as far as trying a 37 uh, anti-tank gun on this Jeep. So it goes to show you how much utility this little guy had. Uh, here we're making that choice between that Modus 50 or the 30. And then here, in case you don't know what that bar is, the Germans used to string high-tension wire across roads, uh, which would, you know, obviously injure people in vehicles and even decapitate them. So uh, the, um, <clears throat> the Americans put that bar there, and that's what that's all about. And I might mix and match the 50 with that bar, because I just think that bar is way cool. It tells a story, and I like that. Okay, so there's that. Uh, so our obligatory uh, sprue tree, which to me it doesn't do, which I always like. And we can see it comes in three sprues plus the clear one. We've got two loose parts here. That's the 50 and the body and then our decal sheet. Of course, we'll look at this stuff in more detail. Color translation chart. Uh, they, it looks like they have an exclusive with AK colors here. And there's also this Acrivision, Acrigian. I don't know how to pronounce that, unfortunately. I'm not familiar with that brand, but in case that's the one you want to use, it gives you the translations. But, uh, you know, we can mix and match the paint. So it does give us markings for three different variants. This particular one, Company A, 70th Armor Regiment, 1st Army Division, U.S. Army Normandy, 1944. Uh, your nice olive drab, olive drab uh, design there. <clears throat> and it looks like that AK olive drab is quite light. Almost kind of in the range of the Mission Models colors. Certainly much lighter than the Tamiya, uh, well, the olive drab right out of the bottle, the acrylic. But we can always... T um, we can always tint it. So, well, there it is there, all three angles. And, uh, well, we get that cool sunny boy. Well, so I guess we got all six angles, so we can see everything very clearly. So that's great. Uh, the second version is that 30 cal. That's going to be, kind of, let's see here, 36 reconnaissance regiment, 9th Army, U.S. Army, Northern France, 1944. So this stuff's all post D-Day invasion. So very nice, very nice markings there. And I rather like this uh, hell, heaven, or home. Hopefully it's, uh, well, heaven or home. So very cool. Kind of tells a story, right? And then finally, we have a British version, probably a Lend-Lease um, uh, Lend uh, vehicle here. It's 21st Army Group, British Army, Normandy, 1944. So it's all the same period, slightly different markings, and the machine gun it makes the difference. So, and there it is. So that's the instruction booklet. So here's our decal sheet. Uh, we do have markings for three different vehicles, as we saw in our instructions. 
They are Meng brand, and I had no problems with the FT-17 uh, cal, so they should be fine. We do get placards, as we can see, in yellow and silver. We'll get a little bit closer on the placards. I have to say they're a little soft. And it's kind of odd because the, the first aid uh, markings there are very, very sharp. But uh, they are tiny, these placards. So really, I think it's going to be fine. They are very, very small. And then, of course, our instrumentation uh, decals there, too, which I really, really like a lot. So, so that's what you get there. So here are the uh, clear parts. We can see the windshield there and the uh, headlights. And uh, the beef I have about the windshield is that the wipers are cast uh, actually on there. Now that detail is raised on one side, but it's flat on the other, which makes painting that a nightmare. It's really tough to paint. But uh, there's actually a solution in the box. Uh, when we take a look at the windshield frame and the, uh, in the styrene, we'll see that they actually do uh, give us the windshield wipers on the other side, which is going to really help painting. But still, we're going to need a heck of a steady hand to uh, paint those windshield wipers. I much I like it when those are photo etched and we attach them on top, much easier to paint. So that's going to be a bit of a challenge. But uh, they're the clear parts. They look good. They're nice and clear and crisp. So there's our body. It comes in one piece. And you can get an idea of how actually small this thing is. Now, I don't like this color of plastic. I much more prefer sort of neutral gray plastic. I really like that Tamiya uh, 38T color of the plastic. But this will do. And I want to make sure that we have nine slots. So if we actually count them up, we do have the Ford uh, accurate nine slots in the grill. So there it is. I'll pull in a bit closer so we can see some of the detail. But uh, we can see that the floor is uh, smooth. But we're probably going to do a bit of chipping there like we always do for the uh, footwear on it. But it uh, looks good. And uh, the plastic is quite thick. And it's good quality and nice molding. No flash or anything like that. So that's nice. So the other sprues in no particular order. This one's going to be uh, X for X-ray. We get one of these in the box, and this is going to be our machine gun parts. And uh, likely the Mang flamethrower kit uh, is probably sharing the other two sprues that we'll look at in a second. And this is probably where it differentiates. So I would think that the flamethrower kit in this bag would have the flamethrower parts. But in ours, it's got the uh, machine gun parts. So here it is there. And uh, in the bag was this loose part, and this did not break off the sprue. It's supposed to be uh, separate uh, according to our sprue map. So there's your 50 cal mod deuce and uh, the comments I've read on this and uh, from what people have said and I totally agree with it. That's probably the finest styrene molding of a 50 cal that I've seen. I mean look at that perforated shroud there. That is styrene. That is not PE. That is simply amazing. That looks great. And the other parts are just as nice. I mean look at that. Part is tiny and uh, it's crisp and just the detail is exquisite. So the rest of the machine gun parts just as impressive as that 50 caliber body. I mean, look at the molding. I mean, we have a little bit of flash on the handle there, but I'll take that any day. And, uh, well, you don't even need aftermarket barrels here. I mean, this is great. You don't need brass. Look at that. And uh, now, granted, I haven't built every model kit out there, but I've built quite a few, and I just have to say that this is some of the finest moldings I've seen. It looks like we get three different versions of the 50 cal barrels. So, oh, they look fantastic. Absolutely amazing. Look at the detail. And they are slide molded. As we can see, the barrels are hollow. There it is there. And uh, they're nice and crisp and deep. So we don't even have to worry about getting our pin vise out. Look at the muzzle, the hole in the muzzle there. Absolutely amazing. And then, uh, yeah, look at this 50 cal uh, feed strip. And look at the size of it compared to my finger. And the detail is superb. I mean, absolutely amazing. Just like in the FT-17 kit, it had that Hotchkiss uh, feed strip, but uh, these are 50s. A little bit of metallic paint on there, and uh, yeah, like I said, I'm just blown away by that. Uh, there's a really tiny little part that looks like the charging handle right there. Look at how small that is. So we're going to have to be really careful there not to lose that guy. And uh, well, your 50 cal uh, ammo boxes, or 30s possibly, I'm not sure exactly, but the handles look great. So you get two of those. So absolutely superb. So that's your, uh, that's your X, uh, X for X-ray sprue, and you get one of those. So next up is going to be B for Bravo. We get one of these, and this is probably common to both the Mang Jeep kits, uh, this one in the flamethrower version. And again, the molding on this sprue is absolutely fantastic. This is a Browning 30, and we can see it looks great too. And it is slide molded. <clears throat> now we might have to go in there with our pin vise if we do decide to mount the 30. It's a little small, that hole, but again, looks absolutely fantastic. And uh, yeah, uh, let's see here. I've got a little bit uh, more bullet detail here. Look at this. Again, amazing. That's the feed from, for the 50s, so that looks fantastic. Gosh, I like that. Wow, absolutely amazing. 
Meng's got some of the finest molding that I've seen. And uh, there's a stand for the 50. And usually with round parts, we get knockouts. And you can see that we don't have any here. So kudos to Meng for that. And uh, well, let's look at the windshield. So we can see we have the raised detail for the wipers on this side. And then the, pl uh, the clear part will go uh, on the back of that with the detail facing out. So we actually don't have to worry about having to paint windshield wiper wipers on a flat, transparent part. So that's a great solution. It's still going to be a bit of a challenge uh, making sure we paint that uh, clear part nicely. But uh, that's going to alleviate a lot of those problems. And uh, I don't see any knockouts on the back of that. Uh, do we have any? No, we don't. And, and look at that. It's even got the detail on the back there. Wow. Absolutely amazing. Okay, and there's the hood. And it's got the little bumpers on it for when the windshield is down, which is kind of nice. And it's got the little clasp detail on the side. Let's see if we can't see that. Well, it's a little shadow, but we can see it there. It looks good. Right there where my finger is. Right there. Very nice. That's good attention to detail. And what's nice about this is no knockouts on the inside. So if we do pose that open, we don't have to worry about filling it. Most manufacturers will give you a knockout there. And the Hobby Boss kit for that uh, CCKW, same thing, no knockouts there. So that's good. Kudos to them for that. So what else can we look at here? Well, that's about it. I mean, we got the little rug sacks. The detail's nice. Those will paint up beautifully. And our little jerry cans. And there's our 50 cal box, I do believe, the ammo box. So there that is. And, uh, well, there's the guard for the light. It's a little thick, I have to say. We may be nicer in photo etch, but uh, I think it's pretty darn close, so it'll be fine. And, uh, well, there's some tools, fire extinguisher. There's the Garand. That sort of mounts as a stowage uh, weapon on the windshield. Uh, it's a little light on detail, and, in fact, we can see that the uh, trigger and trigger guard are solid. So, well, I don't know if we'll be able to clean that out, but... Uh, I don't know if we can live with that. If you're comp contest bound, you're going to have to clean that up somehow because that's a dead giveaway. But uh, in general, it looks good. So I think that's about it on this one. And uh, yeah, the seats, there, there is detail. Uh, if I catch it in the light just right, it's very subtle, but it kind of has that. I'm not sure if that's vinyl or what it is that the military use there. But uh, we can just barely see it. It's, it's there. It's very subtle. So the seats have a slight texture on them. I think we can see it. It's kind of hard to catch it in the light. But you can just barely see it right where my finger is here. And finally, we get this big sprue. This is going to be A for Alpha. Now, this sprue, in addition to the one we just looked at, B for Bravo, those are going to be common to both the Meng kits. So if you do have your eye on that Meng Flamethrower Jeep, uh, this sprue and the last one we looked at are going to be uh, in both kits. So they'll give you some idea of what you're getting. So one part did break off the sprue, and that's the battery. We can just see the detail is great. And it still has the sprue gates on it, but uh, it does look fantastic. But this is the advantage of having all the sprues individually bagged, because if parts do break off, uh, we don't lose them. And I know in these environmentally conscious times, all these bags seem like it's excessive, but it is important for model kit packaging, because oftentimes parts do break off, and we don't want to lose them. So that's definitely saved us in this case. And like the other sprues, the uh, detail on this one is absolutely exquisite. There's the little engine, and that's our little uh, inline four Willys L143, I'm sorry, L134 Go Devil. That's a 60 horsepower engine, and uh, it actually hauls 800 pounds. Hard to believe. Three speed transmission, so that's kind of interesting. So there that is, and uh, that, uh, that engine is so great that uh, that would definitely be worth posing that uh, hood open. Uh, this is a cover for our radiator. Look at the detail. It looks absolutely great. And uh, oh, look at that. Oh, man, that is just so exquisite. That's one thing Meng does very good is their, uh, their parts are so delicate and so beautifully molded. And uh, there's the, uh, well, it looks like the gas tank. And the horn uh, is slide molded. We can see there, which is nice. It'd be a bit of a drag to have to hold that out. But that looks, and look at that. That is really, looks in scale. That's fantastic. And, uh, well, there's our leaf springs. They look good. Uh, yeah, let's get those in focus. And then, uh, well, I guess those are the boots. Uh, we're not going to play guess the parts. We won't check everything out. But there's some grab handles. Yeah, those are always fun to deal with. Uh, yeah. And the steering wheel, yeah, it does look in scale. So that looks great. Now, this part here is a little smooshed, but it's in a good, uh, good, decent shape. We just have to be careful. And uh, I guess that would be the timing belt. And look at the fan. Oh, man, that looks great. A little bit of uh, silver dry brush on there, and that's going to look fantastic. Uh, transfer case, maybe. Transmission. There's the oil pan. Uh, stick shift. It looks in scale. I mean, if you look at my finger, if 
I can actually find where that is. There it is. Yeah, I can see it looks good. Yeah, it looks good. And uh, what else we have on here? There's the uh, coolant. Or maybe that's the air filter. Yeah, it's probably the air filter. Looks great. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, it looks great. Okay, so this is the bugaboo of the wheels. I mean, on the face, they look great. They got the sidewall lettering. They're not weighted, so that's uh, one little strike against them. But uh, they're two-part, and the seam goes down the entire circumference. I don't like that. That's going to lead a little bit of work to get those in order. We'll look at different ways to solve that problem and how we can make that uh, seam disappear. Same problem we had with the CCKW. If you really wanted to get fancy, you can go with resin wheels. Now, Tamiya and the new Tacom Jeep, they do this much better, better engineering. They uh, have a two-part wheel, but the seam is on the back where you can't see them. So a uh, much better, much better way of doing it. That would be one strike against this kit or these wheels. I don't know why Meng does such a fantastic job on everything else. Uh, I guess it's modeling, right? I guess that's part of the modeling experience. So I'm not griping about it. I'm just saying maybe some people would want to get the resin wheels. So. And again, I just want to say, you know, I compare a lot to Tamiya just because they are the gold standard. I'm not bashing them. So uh, there's our one piece uh, frame and I'm just looking for knockouts. And I have to say, I haven't seen too many, but we are going to counter a couple, but there aren't any on this side. Uh, whereas the Tamiya ones normally have lots on this side. doesn't matter. We don't see this side, but uh, it's kind of interesting to consider. And however, on the back of the seats, we've got two nasty ones, and those are in bad places. And we're going to probably have to use our technique that we did in our Kubel wagon. So we'll look at that in our construction video. So that's uh, some knockouts there. And again, I haven't seen very many. Uh, we got a couple there on our back of our tail uh, tailgate. Not in a terrible place. Pretty easy to clean up. But interesting enough, they've cast that tool. I'm not sure if that's the crank to get the manual start. Uh, I don't think so. That's probably just a pry bar. But they've casted it in. Um, it's a little bit old school, but uh, yeah, it saves us a bit of work, so that's fine. And that'll do it for this unboxing episode. Check back soon for the build video of this model coming up in the very near future. In the meantime, keep your workbench tidy and well lit, and as always, stay well and all the best.